Welcome back, y'all. I hope you enjoyed the intermission that was How To Melty Blood, where we talked about the gameplay. But now, it's time to get back to analyzing that ever-entangling plot that most people have never read. For those uninitiated, this is part two of a video series on Melty Blood, and won't make all that much sense if you haven't seen the first part and a half. We covered a lot of ground in those videos, and as such, we're going in media res, as the pretentious folks say. Link to the playlist and the card for those who need to catch up. I'll be here till you get back, I promise. Okay, welcome back to the three of you who left. Let's get back into it. Where we last left off story-wise, our protags Shiki and Sion were just about to get into quite the kerfuffle. Sion's inability to communicate even the most basic things being the instigator. The fight starts, and then ends just as quickly as it began. After a flawless victory against Sion, Shiki, after wrecking havoc but not so much that he... finally gets through to Sion. He asks Vamp Jr. two things. One, what, two, the f Sion answers promptly that she had just assumed that Shiki would go all racist on her. You know, because she peeked into his memories and saw. Because of her assertion on Shiki's character, she wanted to ascertain his compliance by force before anything crazy happened. Shiki, not being able to deny that completely because he famously did indeed do... Reasons with Sion that, though he gets it, he hasn't done that in ages. Can a person grow and change? This is a fun little exchange. Sion has, for all intents and purposes, only read a little more than Shiki's biography on the Type Moon wiki. She doesn't truly know our boy. If you, a person new to this series, are watching these videos as your introduction, one, OMG, hi, I hope this has been informative, but two, you probably think similarly to Sion at this juncture. Based on the information given, Tono Shiki is a mentally ill schizoid. Calm one moment needs to be put on a leash the next, oh my. It probably doesn't matter how many times I call him our boy when the counter to that endearment is as simple as showing this clip. But see, actually meeting someone in person is different from what you read about them. In a similar vein, after spending a whole story with him and Suki, cuddled up to the fireplace as he softly sings you to sleep, you come to understand that Shiki is probably the most sane person in this cast. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Of all these schmucks, he's the one who you'd trust the most to save you in a pinch. Which speaks to everyone else in retrospect, but seriously, it's true. He does go sicko mode from time to time, but it's only because of this very spoilerific reason I'm putting on screen right now. If you are interested in actually reading Suki one day, um, hey, speaking of, Suki Ri just got an official English version announced, uh, just putting that out there, then don't read what's on screen right now. Just don't. Huge spoilers. Uh, go read Tsukihime first. It's great. But I am including this little tidbit for posterity's sake. But even without all that pish-posh, wishy-wash context, everything you could want to know about the real Tonoshiki explicit version is found in his post-walloping communication with Miss Etlam. Look at his confused but understanding expressions. His tone, gentle yet stern like that one guy. He's a real demure picture boy. He's not sure how Sion knows so much about him, but he still looks at the moon as waxing instead of waning. He wants to know what her deal is and if their goals are aligned. It doesn't matter if she tried to attack him, she's still human. People miscommunicate all the time, Shiki especially, so he likes to give people the benefit of the doubt. Plus, things are now well below boiling point. No conflict is to be had probably. That outlook is what makes Shiki eternally endearing, but it's also the reason there's like 40 bad ends in Tsukihime. You can't trust vampires and clergy members like that and get out scot-free all the time. Those are bad people. You gotta trust the people at your house more. Your classmates. Thankfully, though Sion is a little socially awkward, she's not about to stab him in the back yet. She starts explaining what she's doing in Masaki and those goals of hers. 
The ones we talked about in the last part and all that. As it turns out, to Shiki's bewilderment and joy, they do indeed share similar interests. Extremely similar. Uncoincidentally similar. It's so specific, it's almost like Shion probed his brain for the information that'd be most appealing to him. See, more than just the weird rumor thing that has Shiki badgering about Masaki Town, Sion informs Shiki about her intensive research to find the cure for vampirism. It's here where I have to gear shift and talk about a character I brought up briefly during the mechanics section. This is Satsuki Yumizuka. Colloquially, also known as Sachin. Reason for that nickname on screen now. Satsuki is my favorite. <laughs> this is the person Sion is referring to when she says to Tono, you've seen a friend become a vampire before your own eyes. It sucks, bro. I know. Trust me. A sentence which, while paraphrased a tad by myself, is very notable in Melty Blood. Not for the contents, mind you, but for its response. Within Shiki, and I'm not joking, this elicits the only display of legitimate hostility he ever has in the entire story of Melty Blood. Barring, of course, another route where Sion also brings up the same topic and he threatens to kill her. In this route, he responds to Sion with an accusatory, you seem to know a lot about that, paired with this portrait of unrestrained malice. Everything else to our boy is, you know, just goofy fun time with maybe a little learning for good measure here and there, but he doesn't even pretend to play when this is the topic. He shakes off his predilections almost instantly, but our boy was close to letting Mr. Nanaya out. Shiki, if you couldn't tell, is kind of an oddball. He doesn't care that Sion knows everything else about him, even probably what his Pixiv likes are. But he sets a fine line at Satsuki. The reason being, Melty takes place after Satsuki's route in Tsukihime. As such, it is my duty to summarize it here in full because it's relevant to Melty Blood's story for obvious reasons. No worries, no major spoilers, just the basic beats important to Melty Blood. Won't take that long, I promise. Uh, let's get into it. It was a story in which Sachin got infected with vampirism and had to stave off the blood cravings with Shiki. It ended bitterly with Satsuki abandoning everyone she's ever loved to ensure that she doesn't hurt them. Reason she does this is because near the end of the route, she reached a crossroads after not being able to control herself. See, she attempted to drink Shiki's blood, and though she didn't succeed, she sure as hell tried. She couldn't control herself no matter what she did. So that was the path she chose, isolation. Satsuki, presumably post Tsuki, will live the rest of her meager existence away from the sunlight and on a permanent fast, her days consisting of nothing but sleep. In her stead, she leaves Shiki unsure if she's even alive by the time Melty starts up. But of course, he tries to stay hopeful. On the off chance she is still there, of course he wants to help her. He loves her. He didn't even care that she tried to drink his blood. His ethos has always been, humans make mistakes. To him, Satsuki, no matter what changes her body has gone under, is undoubtedly still human, despite everything. Even if she's not alive, however, he still feels he owes it to her to support what could have saved her. That's a really beautiful story. Tear up every time I start thinking about it. As a brief distraction, I'm just sitting here holding this book as a prop, but there's a really good piece of art in here that I think you all should see of Satsuki. And Kohaku by extension, but mainly the Satsuki piece. Uh, look at that. I don't know if the camera's focusing on it, but look at that. Isn't that just a beautiful work of art? God, go by the colorful moon uh, thing. It's, it's wonderful. But anyways, the way Shiki and Satsuki's journey parallel each other really is the stuff of beautiful writing. They both have inner demons that they're trying to overcome, both inflicted upon them not of their own volition, but it's just something they have to live with. While Shiki succeeded, now being in full control of his Nanaya self, Satsuki just couldn't. She couldn't overcome her inversion impulse, no matter how hard she tried. To be fair, how easily could you overcome your throat burning all the time and your body deteriorating? It's not a fun existence, and I imagine it just feels 
disgusting. Just a thirst that's never sated. I don't like being thirsty doorbelly, but I couldn't imagine it getting to that level. Truly one of the best stories, if not the best story I have ever read. Honestly, I don't know why I haven't made a video about it. <sighs> I would highly recommend you all go read the Satsuki route. It's amazing. Oh god, my delusional daydream headcanon sure is amazing. Uh, see, the problem is, that route, what would have been the best story ever put to pen, uh, doesn't exist. And a move that still legitimately baffles me to this day, Melty Blood takes place after Vaporware. I can't lie to you all, I used to really hate this game because of that. I've learned to not look at everything so black and white since, but even now, my god, this is a jarring choice. For those that are normal and sane and not schizophrenic, the Sachin route was cut in Tsukihime due to time constraints. It was going to be so heavy on CGs and unique plot that it simply just had to be shelved for the future. If you know Tsukihime, you know how stretched thin that damn script is. CL's route, um, we'll talk about her later, don't worry, is literally half copy-pasted from Arcoades, and that's not even the worst offender. Satsuki's route was the most unique, but that also made it the most isolated. Thus, easiest to be cut when you're working with a shoestring budget on a VN with six, now five different stories. Sachin's tale had the chance to be made into its own thing a few months after Suki when Type Moon was financially viable, but the mushroom said, nah, I got a cold. <laughs> I'm gonna write Kagetsu Toya instead. And uh, that cold must have been really nasty because it sure shows in the writing for Kagetsu. Uh, comma, also, I'm not joking. Nasi wanted to write something simple instead of something difficult, which, to be fair, I get it. Being sick as the pits, but like, just wait a week or two, IMO. If I could reincarnate, I'd like to be born again as the one white blood cell that could have stopped this future from occurring. I would fight off Nasu's virus so that he could, in turn, fight off his own urge to write mid instead of peak. I'd be like Trunks from Dragon Ball, but like, instead of the world, I saved the fate of a non-existent anime book, i.e. way cooler. Apparently, and this is from an ancient interview that if I can find I'll throw on screen, but if not, source, trust me bro. The concepts for the route got repurposed into Unlimited Blade Works and Fate Stay Night, but, and sorry for the constant allusions to other things. I find that as believable as Shigeru Miyamoto saying that Master Quest was Ura Zelda, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, that's a broad enough thing, that probably is understood by a large swath of people. Basically though, for those uninitiated, it's just a half-truth to placate fans. All that aside, let's actually explore how this non-existent route is used in service to Melty Blood. Structurally, it makes sense for Shiki to blindly help Sion if she's researching something that can save his beloved. This vampirism-based plot point is one that no one else in the cast could fit but Satsuki. Sion also being a vampire like Dear Sachin means Shiki feels some innate sympathy for her. He never says it out loud, but he knows Sion's disposition from the get-go. His sensitivity when it comes to non-humans is off the charts. Again, refer to the spoilerific explanation, or go watch Manpig's video or something for a more in-depth version. Pretty good vid, would recommend. That Shiki so willingly goes along with Sion when it's against his own best interest, like maliciously so at times, makes perfect sense with both that innate sympathy and especially curing Satsuki being a caveat. Shiki feels bad over what happened to Yumizuka and so wants to aid the research that could have helped her above all else even if it aligns him with people who gaslight girl like Gate Bossum. Shiki's not dumb or blind to any of Sion's tactics, mind you. He knows exactly what Sion is doing in bringing up topics like Sachin. Rightly tells Sion to shut up about it. He's gonna help her. Because of her goals, Shiki feels he has to. As on the side, the story never clarifies if Satsuki is just painful for Shiki to think about, or if Nasu was just lazy and didn't want to write about the details, because, oh boy, is that pretty much all we get on the topic. But from an objective standpoint, that is the only information you need from the Satsuki route to understand Shiki's motivation. Um, it works perfectly fine in the story presented to us. 
But objectivity sucks. Don't fall for Nasu's trap of placating you with first draft ass material like Shiki getting real worked up in one scene and then never bringing it up again, despite how much it clearly means to him and despite how relevant it is to the story of Melty Blood. What happened to Satsuki is clearly a nightmare scenario to our boy. And, you know, in this tale of dreams and rumors coming alive, she never pops up even once. You know, not to mention that you think it would have some kind of effect or sway on his heart to see this same shit happening to Sion in front of him. You know, over the story, you could see him pick up on cues and remember them. You know, you could see him be like, oh, oh, oh I've seen this one before. But no, nothing, nothing. Shiki just like is there for the majority of the story. He interacts with Xion plenty, but no, he's just kind of there. He's just kind of vibing, which nothing wrong with that, but if you're gonna set the story after Satsuki's non-existent route, you gotta think about it. You gotta think about it because Shiki's been through some stuff, but it feels like he hasn't been through some stuff is what I'm getting at. I don't know. By looking too deeply into this for you, uh, I don't care. Let's continue. I used to fall for Nasu's antics myself. This little moment of Shiki's used to make me go all <laughs> But now I see the soullessness behind those eyes, how deep that void really goes. His eyes are empty because there's nothing behind them at all. If you go even more than ankles deep into this, Satsuki's involvement in this entire game and story falls flat on its beautiful face. Case in point, um, I've brought this up a few times, you might not have known or, you know, really considered it, but, uh, Melty takes place after Sachin's story. And more than her not being in the plot, more than all that, right, she wasn't even playable in the original. <laughs> it's almost like Satsuki being a vampire was some sort of quick fix for Nasu to make Shiki empathize with Sion's plight. But the story never takes the time to say, hey, wait, these two do have a lot of common actually, let's uh, go into the implications of that. Nah, Satsuki's route is mentioned a handful of times, all of which essentially go the same way. Sion or the audience through context clues denoting, wow, Shiki sure did have a bad time during nondescript event with one or no details. I'm sure he misses Sachin a lot. Nasu is trying to have his cake and eat it too. He wants this setup that fits perfectly with Melty Blood's story, but he also wants to sweep Sachin under the rug because it's such a glaring hole in both Suki and now here. It's a square peg that fits perfectly into the slot, but there's no holder underneath to actually hold the details there. Nasu either didn't want to waste time expanding upon a story that would never be released, or spoiling a story that would maybe come out... eventually. So, what does he do? He placates the audience who actually cares about these things and looks into them with placebo member berries. And this scene with Shiki conveys a lot of surface level context within Melty Blood, but if you think about it being based in actually nothing, kind of sours the taste. Um, for me, at least, I've been writing about Tsukihime for years, I'm gonna be more critical than most people. For most everyone else, this deception tactic works maliciously. Seriously, I have never heard anyone talk about how bizarrely lacking in details Melty Blood suddenly becomes whenever Satsuki's name pops up. Here's an example so you know I'm just not talking nonsense. There's a scene midway through this route where Shiki starts having an internal panic attack remembering something with Satsuki. He and Sion are walking through this old construction site that was abandoned and something about it messes with the boy deeply. Sion denotes, because again, she's connected to him via her etherlight thing, how bizarre and terrifying it is to her that outwardly Shiki is just calm as can be, while on the inside, he's losing it in this tidal wave of emotion. She feels guilty for even looking at the memory Shiki's currently reliving. This right here is the start of what could be a very good scene. You know, it could really convey why Shiki is so invested in getting a vampirism cure. We already know the overarching beats, but let us really soak in those emotions. But as soon as it gets interesting, and I mean literally as soon as it gets engaging, the plot 180s and introduces a boss fight. Just out of nowhere and suddenly, there's no cause or reason for it. More egregious, it's a fight that is meaningless to the plot. 
And of course, this emotional beat with Sachin in remembrance is never brought up again. Never. Past this point, she's not even mentioned in any other routes. Like, she just doesn't exist anymore. Nasu wrangled out his three points on a whiteboard and called it a day, never once expanding upon any of them. Now, a uh, question. Would it not be more prudent to show us this flashback of Shiki and Sachin, especially considering how Sion's progressing vampirism is usually the final wedge between her and Shiki? The story has all these connections set up. They are literally right there, but it refuses to actually capitalize on any of them. I'm not gonna grandstand and say you need Satsuki's route for Melty Blood to work, because as much as I hate to say this as a fan of her character, you don't. You just need, like, any kind of substantial context that is more than a literal bullet point. It's actually more and more jarring in hindsight. As I'm sitting here recording this, I can't get over it. Every time she's brought up, Satsuki's just shoved to the side. Sion is already peeking into Shiki's mind 24-7, but never, ever comments on anything she sees. I say let her see stuff like Satsuki and Shiki saying goodbye forever. Let that have an emotional impact on Sion. Let her, dare I say, insert herself into Satsuki's position. Sion already has unrequited feelings that develop for Shiki later on, and this could push that further as she relates to sweet Sachin. If Sachin truly is gone from the world, let her be fucked up and try to fill that hole. Sion is not good at social connections. This could be, as she sees it, her ticket in. Let this all then parallel in the endings where Sion regretfully finds herself in the exact same place, but twice as lonely and realizing how much she's fucked up. Finally, take all of that and make the true ending where she beats her vampirism and her own predilections towards Shiki all the more powerful. These two, Satsuki and Sion, have so many connections and I'm sorry for repeating myself, but the story either doesn't want to show them off so as not to spoil a work that never came out, or more accurately, in my opinion, just outright refuses. Be it out of laziness or out of a rushed script, who knows? Melty Blood in its introduction was pretty all right, but this is pretty slapshot writing. I know, I like this character more than most people. I'm that weirdo who picks a side character that had like 20 minutes of screen time and say, yeah, that's mine, I claim that. But you all see what I mean, right? It's not just me who thinks this is a glaring hole. Satsuki as a character really should have been better utilized in this game. A game that, again, is a sequel to her own story, yet never considers what that means. She exists as a plot point dressed up in fluff to pull the wool over people's eyelids. The ultimate placation by Sir Mush. And again, all of this would not be so egregious were it not tied to both of our main characters' motivation. I'm just complaining at this point, so, you know, here's another suggestion. Why not have her playable, our girl, Satsuki Yumitsuka, and some flashback of some kind, literally any kind, you know, it can be a reoccurring thing. It's clear, and we're gonna get into this later, it's clear that Melty Blood was struggling to pad out length as is, so I feel like this would just be the perfect opportunity to uh, streamline a lot of that, but why not? It, it, would, it would be a very compelling through line. This game took years to develop. The Mushroom Man, Kinoku Nasu, uh, wrote Tsukihime in six months by comparison, whereas he had like two years of just kind of riding on and off a melty blood. I'm not gonna say he that's all he did because no, some groundwork was being done for Fate Stay Night, which would release in early 2004. And you know, additionally, there was also Kagetsu Toya being written on and off at the time. You know, that's not all he did, but still a significantly longer time frame. I get it, games are hard, but like, I don't know, man, you can do better. You can do a little better, just a little bit, maybe. Ooh. It's just crazy. And again, we're gonna get into it later. This game's already just reaching, reaching for time that it doesn't got. You know, it's just, this game already pads out length. Why not just like add something substantial and relevant to the plot? I don't get it. I legitimately don't understand any of this from a writing position. If you haven't caught on already, um, Melty Blood, the pacing structure, the everything of Melty Blood, this is just a longer version of my CL video. 
uh, link to that somewhere. Okay, let's uh, ignore this issue and just move on like our boy Kanoku. I learned it from you, dad. After they converse for a time and work out the kinks, the two, being Sion and Shiki, agree to team up and seek out Arcoade. The connection between curing vampirism and Arcoade being that Arcoade is one of the original vampires, the basis for the myth, or as they're called in Suki lore, a true ancestor. Not a human, but an entirely different phenomena that can infect humans with the affliction via biting them. Think of them as an entirely different evolutionary chain. They come from the moon they're strong as f and akin to natural disasters, yet they still have emotions and... <sighs> None of this was actually explored in depth or made any sense until Suki Rei came along and badgered you over the head with it. Um, the manga actually was a pretty decent exploration. Um, so I'm sorry to have to word vomit on you like that, because that's what Tsukihime and Melty Blood both do. That's how true ancestors are described. I'll try and expand upon it in a way that actually makes sense in the beginning of the next part. Don't worry. But back to Melty. Shiki agrees to play mediator because Arcway doesn't really care for anyone else. But Shiki, she likes him. He made a ramen that one time. Sion thinks the reason Arcoade likes him is that they're lovers, but that's not the case for reasons Nasu swept away long ago. Arcoade respects Shiki because he's the only person who can actually kill her. Plus, he's like, a uh, super chill and would never do that on purpose. It may sound like a weird reason to respect someone, but if you were an immortal vampire, I'm sure you'd feel the same way, probably. I'm not gonna go any further into it because it's not relevant to Melty Blood, but uh, for more knowledge on the Arcoid Shiki dynamic, I'm gonna plug myself real quick. Check out my Arcoid analysis video, link up top. I made it like two years ago, so uh, ignore the Karno Kyokai clips. I was still learning how to make VN footage interesting. Think I figured it out? I don't know, how do you like this video? Melty Blood is more or less a VN, is this edited fun? Anywho, I do think it's good that the story isn't afraid to show Sion getting all flustered and tripping over herself due to being wrong. It's endearingly embarrassing and lets her actually act her age for once. The bit of Shiki cheering on her research is adorable too, especially the I feel like I could finally help her line in reference to Satsuki. Shiki knows that all of this was manipulative in nature, but the two are helping one another from here on, and that's that. That mutual aid leads eventually into a blooming friendship. Sion keeping Shiki focused, and Shiki helping Sion live a little. It's a good dynamic. Melty as a story from here on is carried by their interactions. Again, Nasu is a character writer, and it shows because this is the first strong leg we've had to stand on since this video started. Sion, of course, doesn't change right away from her overly cautious self because of one conversation. She still lacks on the whole trusting someone despite Shiki now being on a first name basis with her. More Japanese diction exposition is on screen right now, but just know being on a first name basis with someone in Japan is like a best friend type thing. Before they part for the night with the promise to meet up the next, Sion proves she still doesn't know how to trust people properly and attaches her etherlight slash nanny cam to Shiki. She doesn't tell him about this, of course. It's a severe breach in privacy and something that'd make anyone rightfully pissed if they found out, but Sion just doesn't think about that. It's not even a factor. She thinks in utility. Why wait for Shiki to give a report if she can read it all herself? And more importantly, if things go awry with Arcoade, now she has a hostage. Again, the Aetherlight can fry your nerves if Sion wills it, which I imagine feels like this. Teeth tearing through skin like fingers through cheap cloth to quench a burning throat. The lining sticks together on that boiling summer night and needs some sustenance to loosen up. And so, the vampire drinks. The imagery here is pretty good, as is the narrative stating Sion's descent into vampire status in all but name. You know, in case the audience hasn't picked up on it yet. And to those who have snatched that detail, it proves them right in their suspicions. Rewarding storytelling. Simple to do, but beautiful all the same every time it pops up. In Sion's dream flashback, she goes on to remember how a Knight of the Shield saved her life from it. Yet, she still became a vampiric offspring of it. It being an individual known as Wara. 
Or, voila, Kia, two things. One, that Knight of the Shield is named Rice and Beans. More on her later. Though, I might pull an Asu and forget, whoopsie. Uh, two, Wara versus Wala. I'm gonna liken this to One Piece, unfortunately, and it's two dubs regarding the naming of this character. One dub of One Piece calls this guy Zolo, the other Zoro. Japanese doesn't have an L sound. Wow, I'm bringing up Japanese diction way more than I thought I would today. Anyways, so it's usually up to interpretation of the source as to which pronunciation is correct, be it an R or L. In the case of Zoro, well, Zoro would be correct because the author explicitly spells it that way and always has. It's sadly not usually that simple. When it comes to Wara, the name is spelt either way depending on what you're looking at. Wara does have a source for his name, however. It's based on, well, the region of Wallachia, the historical and geographical location of Romania today. Fitting, seeing as Wallachia, the character, is based off the historical figure Vlad the Impaler, specifically the rumor that he was a vampire. So by all accounts, his name should be Wallachia, shortened to Walla. This might annoy some people, but I live my life based on vibes, and personally, I think Wallachia sounds better than Warakia. However, when I shorten his name, I will call him Wara instead of Walla. Whenever I say Walla, I think of that Witch Doctor song, and while I do think that's exactly what's playing in this dude's head 24-7 at all times, I still think Wara sounds better than those nonsense made up words. So, Wara, it will be. If you take issue with this, why? It objectively sounds better. Uh, but also, cope and seethe, plus mauled, plus ratio. Back to Sion's nightmare daydream that she's having on a lovely little trash pile, we learn something about Mr. Smile.jpg. And I want you to remember that factoid about Wara being based on the rumor of Vlad the Impaler being a vampire. For a single night, the Night of Tartary, or the Night of Wallachia if you prefer, the names are interchangeable, and I find the dual usage confusing in the plot of Melty proper, so the Night of Wara is what I'll be using from here out for simplicity sake. Wara appears taking the shape of a specific rumor circulating in a given area and gorges on blood. On his first outing ever, centuries ago, he took the shape of Dracula in the Romanian area circa a few years after the real Vlad's death. Following his debut, no one was left in the region, which only made the rumor stronger. And thus his name was ingrained in legend. If you've been paying attention to the plot, that trend of rumor circulating seems to be repeating itself in Masaki Town right now. The basis for a vampire stalking the nightly streets is a very real thing in this town due to the events of Sugihime. It's uncertain exactly what form Wara will take, again to what's seen in Suki. There are many different people gallivanting the nightly streets of Masaki in that visual novel. It could be that guy Nero, it could be a blood-starved Arcoid, it could even be Shiki himself, or his sister Akia. The exact form Wara can take seems to be literally anyone except CL and Satsuki, again, because Nasu f***ing hates those characters. I'm sorry to go on a rant again, but this would work if Melty Blood took place after a nebulous all route, but to fit the rumor as is within the story, one, the Satsuki route would have to be stacked with every player on the field, and two, Satsuki, a vampire, would have to never go out and stalk the nightly streets like apparently everyone else did. Which, I don't know about you, I find that hard to believe. When we get that Satsuki route down the line, I guarantee you, her route's gonna be more fucked up than Sakura's was in Fate Stay Night. I will die by this. She seems the most innocuous on the surface, but no, that girl got some issues. Uh, let's not get bogged down in any more details. My B for going on another tangent. The form Wara takes is uncertain, but one thing isn't. If Wara is allowed to take root, there will be no more Masaki Town. Sion knows that from first-hand experience. After all, her fever dream flashback ends with this. This bloody smiley face. You may call it cringe now, but take your ass back to 2002 when we didn't have a decade of shitty creepypasta behind us. 
There's a reason why this very archetype of a bloody smiley face became a trope. It's very effective in conveying joyous lunacy. Wara appears, drinks blood till he's bursting at the seams, basically a lifetime supply of it, and disperses until rumors start circulating again. Think of him as going in and out of hibernation, with him getting all the needed calories to do so in one swift go. The vampires of the original Sukiverse are often compared to natural disasters, but I think Wara is the only example that fully lives up to that. He doesn't show up often, but when he does, it's horrific. It's like a sudden volcano eruption, something no one was expecting, but when it happens, oh boy, you better fucking run. Granted, he does need rumors circulating around a specific area to appear, which is a rather important linchpin. For instance, in the eastern US, he could easily show up as Bigfoot, though how he would go around sucking blood in that form is, well, up to speculation. Part of me wonders how Wara would fare in the modern age where rumors get spread amongst the internet at blistering speeds. The internet, and social media more importantly, really did change everything about the plot of Melty. Rumors aren't centralized in certain areas anymore. We all know about the lady with a cut up smile in Japan, or Mothman, or any other sorts of various nebulous rumors like that. Any form Wara could take would no longer meet his closed rumor requirement. Again, it is specifically stated that he needs to take root in a rumor circulating around a specific area. Rumors are now everywhere. Would that weaken Wara? Would that make him stronger because more people believe in said rumors? I don't know. Makes me kind of wish Wara would have been in type Lumina just to see what he'd do. That's all in the future though. And again, Tangent City. Back to 2002, where rumors were still somewhat confined mostly to one space. Sion wakes up and starts her daily patrols to see what shape the rumors are taking. During all this, she shows off her thought partition ability, which is visually shown with three text boxes on the screen. The bottom text box is her thoughts on the current situation, the middle analysis of her surroundings, the top her subconscious meanderings. The last one is still stuck in the bad dream she had, focused on Wara and nothing else. These are only three of the myriad of thought trains Shion is said to be riding on. Eventually, all of them get overwhelmed with thoughts of Wara, however, and she has to shut everything out. Fitting as the rumor mill that she's so intently focused on is implicitly linked to Wara. She doesn't really get a reprieve even if she tries to separate the thoughts about it. Thought partitioning, or the ability to think about multiple things at once, is a cool concept, I think? but it feels more than a little hand-fisted in how it's done here. For one, this is the only time it shows up in the story, like across every single route. This is the equivalent of jingling keys so the audience sits through the large expo dump on screen. For two, it feels like it's only here to show off how Wara slowly consumes all of Sion's thoughts, but that could have been done in a less jarring manner. And I'm using jarring bad here, like, you can show thoughts derailing in a jarring manner and it being good. This is jarring derogatory. Tsukihime, the original, for instance, did this in, I'd argue, a perfect manner, with red text and caps lock and backwards text and all that lovely stuff. Sion could have trailed off into Wara over and over or something, and really gotten lost in her thoughts, and it would have been perfectly conveyed in comparison. I say that because, for three, this stuff is so ADHD, I feel like I need subway surfers and Family Guy clips at the top and bottom. I had to read through this scene multiple times to figure out what the hell was happening because you're essentially reading three different entirely separate paragraphs at once. Which I get it, that's the point, it's thought partitioning. Uh, but the point is lame and bad in execution, so I don't care. Seriously, tell me in the comments, were those of you who actually played Melty able to parse any of this, or did you forget about it as soon as the scene ended? Even Sion doesn't like it in conceptualization either, cause after six minutes of waiting through slow text boxes, she blacks out till nighttime. Um, ignore the fact that it was actually Wara getting to her, my explanation's funnier. I mean, not really funnier, but 
It's what I want to believe, fuck you. One moment she's out gathering rumors and stuff, and then the next she's with Shiki hunting and looking for Arclade. Turbo ADHD was just so intensive that she blips. She doesn't even have time to think over that she's suddenly with Shiki or that they're now randomly fighting CL. I.e. the story shoves it aside because it's done with the keys now. And wait, 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 my goodness, has the story done this before? Like, with a character or something, like, brought them up and then just immediately shoved them aside with the battle? I don't know, I, I, I don't remember. Hopefully this isn't a trend, though. Jeez. Anyways, remember how I said the people from the Meiji place were racist back in part one? Ciel is from the church, so she's like, super racist. She wants Sion taken into custody by order of the Catholics and the Atlas Institute. Also, if me suddenly talking like this and jumping from point to point feels jarring to you, good, I've gotten across how it is to play. Ciel isn't religious herself, she's just sent by them. I believe in a trial after the credits, she said she was just following orders. Weird thing to say, don't know why she did that. Especially because in context, CL just wants to take Sion down because Sion has dirty mixed vampire blood. Again, racist. The orders are just a pretense to get her started on that. And so they come to blows with Shiki backing up Sion because CL's ass sure ain't researching a vampirism cure. He knows what horse to back, and my golly, he's back in it. Ciel loses. She's so oh well about it too. It's a good thing Sion wasn't a full-blooded vamp, otherwise Ciel would have had to let her inner clan out. As things are now though, Ciel states Sion is a secondary task. Again, filthy half-blood, not a disgusting full-blooded vamp. Also, that Ciel went easy on her because of Shiki's tagging along, and also, also, she left the oven on, so Ciel's gotta kinda go get that sorted, and also, 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 next Next time, she'll totally stomp them. Okay, I made up one of those, but you get the point. This fight starts and ends suddenly as can be. CL pops up again in order to distract us from a very loosely tied together plot point, and immediately says, Yoroshiku bye bye. Lest I get ahead of myself and not actually fucking explain anything, uh, hi, this is CL. I'm actually going to explain who she is instead of just shoving her aside like Melty Blood does crazy, I know. In the original Suki, CL's route kind of sucked. So let's not talk about it because I already made a video about it, link up top. In every other story in Tsukihime, however, Ciel was Shiki's close friend, guiding him towards what's right pretty much at every pivotal juncture in the boy's life. Likely, the same happened during whatever hypothetical story took place before the events of Melty. She and Shiki are oomphies, for lack of a better term. As such, her dipping out due to her platonic relations with Shiki is all well and good. Why she showed up to fight in the first place is very big convenience of writing, but whatevs, I guess. She lets the two be and leaves to go and fulfill her real goal, the elimination of Wara. The same goal as her two heroes, coincidentally enough. Wow, similar goal, similar interest. Who's to say where this story might go? I'm playing dumb for the camera right now, but what if at the end of the story, CL comes back for a last minute save? I think that would be some wonderful writing. Just the true creme de la creme of storytelling. You plant this little seed early on and you capitalize on it later. It's simple storytelling. Nasu has done it a plentitude of times. So now, all we gotta do is see it to fruition. I think CL has real potential to be a key player in the story. Jeez. I'm excited. I don't know about you, audience, but I'm, I'm excited. For those of you out of the loop, CL never shows up after this point in literally any route. That's the joke. Her involvement ends here. Totally in spite of how she's set up with her violent non sequitur of an introduction. Introduce elements in chaos, then expand upon them later. Basic writing, right? But no. Like so many other elements, Ciel is brought up and brushed aside just as quickly. I think that's the third one in the row we've had. Two times is coincidence, three is a pattern. Was Nasu like, not allowed to do another draft? Seriously, this is jarring. As it is, Ciel is just member berries for Tsukihime fans at best, and filler at worst. Filler. 
in this already short fighting game story with routes that take an hour tops to beat. Seriously, if I hadn't already read Suki, this would mean less than nothing to me. No matter how you slice it, it's a bad narrative choice. Unlike the other two instances, this one is noticeable to anyone with eyes. CL is only in the plot so Shiki can find out that Sion is being pursued by Atlas and the church for scrupulous reasons. Reasons that, uh, factor into the plot? All oh, right, never. Ciel is an inconvenient courier that dips immediately like she's a Skyrim NPC, <laughs> dropping a side quest that simply will never be completed. This tidbit, if you really need it, is something our boy literally could have found out in conversation with the socially inept Xion. Not that it matters whatsoever. Again, this whole tidbit with the Atlas hunting Xion is never brought up past this point. If Sion let that little tidbit slip during a conversation with Shiki, it wouldn't be the first or last time she does that. Again, she's incredibly socially inept. Now, normally, I'd advocate for the narrative showing that people are searching for Sion, but honestly, even that point is meaningless. Like CL, Sion being hunted is dropped immediately, and Shiki doesn't even care about it. No, what he cares about is that Sion withheld stuff from him that is important to their partnership and investigation. Which is the real purpose of the curry filler we have to sit through. It's to make Shiki more wary about his reliance on Sion. Sion coming out of the gate swinging, setting off his Nanaya sense, and attaching weird shit to his head apparently just didn't convey that whatsoever. But I'm being semantical, I suppose. Shiki simply can't take what she says at face value after this. That in a vacuum is a fine plot point. Shiki has been displayed as a character with overly trusting tendencies after all, but nothing has conveyed here that couldn't also be done with Sion just being banned from Atlas. It's, again, never relevant that she's being hunted down after this. Shiki might as well find a note that falls out of Sion's bag that says, You can't come back to Atlas, dirty commie, for as good as CL is utilized here. Which is what really X's my no boxes about all this. CL is a really cool character. The plot could have had its member berry cake and ate it too. CL is headstrong and works fervently to fulfill her goals. She does not like vampires, so to her, it'd be all the more reason to come back and fight the duo again and again. She goes easy on the duo the first time, only because she has a soft spot for Shiki, and Sion isn't even fully turned yet. CL could have been a reoccurring boss fight appearing every now and again to test both the player's ability and Sion plus Shiki's partnership. The first time, it barely affects the duo's relationship, and it's a breezy encounter. But by the last one, you could have CL be in her powered form going all out, and the bombshell she drops could be Sion being Wara's offspring. Um, spoilers by the way. Which would really push Sion and Shiki to their breaking point with one another. Then, depending on the ending, you either overcome and team up with CL to take down Wara as Curry Girl admits she was wrong about Sion, or Shiki finally goes to his senpai's side and helps fight Sion because it's clear she's never doing what she set out to. She lied to him the entire time, and there's no way around it at that point. Sion will never find the cure for vampirism, and that's really all Shiki cared about. It'd be a very bitter ending, but I think it'd be a good one in the overall context of the plot. You'd also get to learn a lot more about CL this way if you weren't already a Suki head. A rival character is practically a staple in any conflict-oriented story, so it's odd that Melty just doesn't fill that niche despite having dangling threads like this. CL fits this role perfectly. IMO. Now, I'm just spitballing. The plot doesn't have to look whatsoever like I suggested here, but I sure as hell think this would have been a lot better than what we got. As is, CL exists as a tool to further Shiki and Sion's relationship. She's not a character. She is a single point on a bulleted list with hundreds of other entries. A point that gets all dressed in fluff, yet is overall insignificant to the whole despite her being something that should matter to the plot. It's something that you can really tell this if you look at the dialogue too, because no one directly interacts with CL. She says some quips sandwiched in between her delivering the details on Sion and is gone from the plot like she came into it. Abruptly and arbitrarily. I'll talk about her as well as other ways she could have been utilized better a bit later, so put a pin in that for now. Damn though, she really deserved to be utilized better in this story. 
Jeez, I hope this trend doesn't continue.